So thank you very much, Sue, and on over to you. Ah, oh, thank you. Um, so I'll just share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Hopefully. Um, where is it now? That one. Is that on it? Um, Can't see it yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, don't worry. Before, you know, when you're just like, why yes. is that on? Right, share screen. There we are. There yes. we are. Is that on there? Yes. Okay. And then now it's the full screen bit. So slideshow. Okay, from start. There we are. Okay, so um, just to quickly introduce myself, I'm Sue Ann. Um, I'm currently working as an advanced nurse practice, practitioner for haematology and haemophilia. And this was a part of my master's um, for advanced practice, which I did two years ago now. And at the time I was working as a clinical nurse specialist. So I based it on, um, barrier, on the end of treatment summaries. So I'm going to quickly whiz through what my findings were and all of that. Um, so the background, so obviously we all know that cancer survival is increasing, which is a good thing. Um, the treatments are getting better and better, but with that in mind, the treatments are also causing further problems. Um, so according to the cancer research, those with cancer diagnosis living in England or Wales are more likely to survive their disease for 10 years or more. Um, and research is showing that this is because of more effective treatments, which is excellent for us. Um, it, however, it's estimated that approximately one in four survivors living after cancer treatment in the UK are left with moderate to se severe physical or psychological issues, which shows that there's a growing number of patients um, with now long term um, effects from their treatment. So that obviously brings challenges for us as healthcare professionals. How do we manage those patients? What's the best way we can support these patients? Um, so that was one of the things that we found in our in our patient group was we were giving these patients treatments, but actually after their treatments, they were really struggling. And personally for me, which I'll come to the next screen now, um, this was quite a big thing for me um, because when I was 11, I was diagnosed with leukemia and I had two and a half years of chemotherapy. Um, and so fab, I'm still here, still alive and kicking, but actually it caused me to have avascular necrosis in my hips. Um, and then I subsequently had two hip replacements. Along with that, I've had to have a shoulder replacement. Um, I have to have two year um, echo scans on my heart. And also that also causes a lot of psychological traumas. Um, I've also had um, psoriasis on the back of my treatment as well. So for me personally, I have a real um, passion for how we can manage patients long-term after their treatments, knowing that these late effects can happen but actually a lot of people aren't aware of late effects um, and a lot of people don't realise the implications of chemotherapy. So if you go to your GP, is it related to the chemotherapy? What can we do about it? What do we need to look out for? So for me as a professional person, but also from a personal perspective, I realise the value of end of treatment summaries. Just as a summary, what is an end of treatment summary? Um, they're, they're used to, they're a, a document which are used to support patients at the end of treatment. It's normally um, an A4 piece of paper um, with a summary of the diagnosis along with treatments and what doctors and healthcare professionals can look out for um, following their treatment. Um, there should be an example, but I don't think it's on there. As I've explained, sorry about that, as I've explained, um, and if anyone wants a copy, I'm more than happy to share that, you know, afterwards. Um, we've used a template in our haematology service and um, essentially on the template, it's just got who the consultants are, who the patient can contact or who the GP can contact. We're also uploading it onto our electronic system as well. So um, that way um, anyone can see that end of treatment summary. So if they attend a day and a if they had any heart problems, people are aware that they've had a chemotherapy that could have potentially caused a heart problem. 
The aim of my study from 2019 was to explore the barriers and facilitators of producing and distributing timely and effective end of treatment summaries. And this was in relation to um, staff members who were working closely with cancer patients. It was to, um, to improve practice and the implementation of end of treatment summaries. I did a literature review beforehand, which was quite interesting. Um, it found that there was quite a few themes coming from um, the implementation of end of treatment summaries, which were mainly time. Um, a lot of the issues were time. Um, apparently, on average, it took 53.9 minutes to complete and prepare an end of treatment summary. Along with time, there was issues regarding um, perceptions of end of treatment summaries. People weren't aware of the value of um, the summaries in patient care. Um, so they, they didn't really know what the point of doing them was. Um, it was actually documented that influential people, including managers and leaders, hadn't advocated the use of end of treatment summaries. Um, and so people didn't feel that they were um, a priority. And another thing that came from it was the lack of guidelines. So there's actually no guidance um, apart from one in the UK that actually suggests using um, end of treatment summaries following cancer treatment. Um, so there's quite a few themes that were picked out from the literature review. So my design was, um, it was, um, interviews um, and I used four participants um, who were staff members using the in inclusion criteria um, and then I used a hermeneutical approach um, to analyse the data from that. Um, so yes, so that went on for about six months trying to get everyone to have time to speak to me. Um, so that just discusses my methods and how I got to um, to my actual findings. I also obtained ethical approval from the trust as well. So the results. So again, like, like the literature review, one of the biggest issues was time and resources. Um, all participants felt that there was um, the main barrier was actually having the time to do it. Two of them participants were actually completing end of treatment summaries and two weren't. Um, a lot of the participants were under a lot of pressure to be able to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. So actually having to do another further activity of end of treatment summaries, um, they just felt they couldn't do it and they couldn't fit it in the time. Um, they all agreed that at that time and pressures had an impact on whether they completed them or not. Um, the other thing was they, they were all aware actually of the how, how good um, end of treatment summaries were with regards to communication and information. Um, and they actually realized that they were important for patients who had completed treatment and the survivorship care. Um, they, they did again suggest that support and leadership was needed um, for for end of treatment summary. So similar to the um, literature review findings, they just felt that there was no one there actually supporting them to help implement these changes, to help them um, complete end of treatment summaries. And again, they had mentioned um, education and guidelines. No one was aware of any guidance with regards to completing them because it's not a formal thing, although it's mentioned in the recovery package from Macmillan. So the study really highlighted the requirements of education and guidelines um, to facilitate and develop the um, end of treatment summaries. Suggestions had also been made with regards to using the same template. So everyone had the same um, template across the trust and potentially across you know, all healthcare services. So at least people could familiarize themselves with end of treatment summaries. Um, and then, Finally, conclusions and recommendations. Um, obviously, it's really difficult to um, recommend time and resources, and especially after COVID, you know, we've all been really pushed and actually end of treatment summaries in, 
in my service in particular had to go be put to one side because we were really struggling to facilitate clinic time seeing patients in the in hospital as inpatients so we had you know we didn't have the time to do it at, at certain periods over the past year but now we are putting them back into practice um i think really one of the one of the things that would help would be having more awareness of the purpose and the benefits of end of treatment summaries along with specific guidelines to survivorship care which isn't available um i think it should be normal practice um, and I think from feedback from what we've had from patients receiving the end of treatment summaries is really positive um, and they find that actually once they finish treatment they know they're not alone and they know that they can come to us despite us saying you've finished your treatment because it is actually probably one of the loneliest points that patients have because they come in weekly or every three weeks for chemotherapy and all of a sudden you're saying you're done now and they don't know where to turn and what to do. So they've had the, the feedback we've had by supplying them with them is that they find it really comforting knowing that the, the GP and other specialists are going to receive a copy of that and it's available on the electronic system as well. So from following that um, dissertation from, from our team, haematology team in particular across North Wales, we've all tried to implement using them. Um, and I'm hopeful that, you know, over the next few months, we, we're able to implement it more within different services for cancer services in, in Betsy as well. But I think that is it. So I just wondered if anyone had any questions or anything like that. Thank you. Um, in which case, I think we 